Yeah, okay. All right, if you don't mind taking a seat, we will get started. Um, a couple months ago, uh, I started following this woman on Twitter. I thought everything she wrote and tweeted was absolutely brilliant. I thought, who is this woman? And um, now I have the pleasure of introducing her and knowing who she is. Um, she is uh, Kelly Brogan, MD. She is boarded in psychiatry and psychosomatic medicine and reproductive psychiatry and integrative holistic medicine, and she practices functional medicine. She is one of the only physicians with perinatal psychiatric training who takes a holistic evidence-based approach to the care of patients. Um, she is medical director also for Fearless Parent, and I'm, I'm very happy to introduce her. Thank you. Okay. I just want to make sure this. Okay, so I'd like to first talk a bit about how uh, it's my perception that psychiatry is sort of the blob that's consuming the American populace. And with 11% of Americans on an antidepressant, one in four women of reproductive age taking one going into a potential pregnancy, uh, there's something we have to look at as a collective. But I also want to introduce you to what I believe will be um, an exciting paradigm shift that's predicated on this idea of evolutionary mismatch and also the role of concepts like epigenetics and nutrition in adult mental health. I think that this is um, often prizes the concept of our denatured, devitalized, and demoralized foodstuffs as being a, an important place to start. But first we have to acknowledge the failure and really dangers of the current paradigm. So I'm sure most of you have some assumptions about the role of monoamines, the role of serotonin, for example, in, in depression, and think about uh, medications like Zoloft and Prozac as being integral to the treatment of, of these uh, disorders or diseases. Uh, but there have been many, many oops. Uh, in medical history, you know, in 1949, the Nobel Prize was awarded for therapeutic lobotomy. And in my opinion, you know, we're not so far off in missing the target with this theory either. And really, psychiatry as a field is in crisis because of the fundamental failures of this most heavily promoted and, and sanctioned meme, which is the serotonin hypothesis of depression and anxiety. So where did it come from? How did the pharmaceutical industry sort of get a foothold uh, with this concept? And, and really the origins are very humble. So it was a, a hypothetical paper in, in the 1960s um, by Joseph Schildkraut, and it was also the observations around treatment of tuberculosis patients with um, monoamine inhibiting uh, medications. And, and this was really what gave birth to this hypothesis, which it still is today. And this is called deductive reasoning, right? So it's, it's not very different than, as David Healy, a, a British psychiatrist, says, than thinking about potentially viewing alcohol as an effective treatment for anxiety, social anxiety. So you think about somebody who's really nervous at a party, and you think about giving them a couple glasses of wine, and probably they're, they're going to feel a little bit better. You can imagine doing a six-week placebo-controlled trial and probably having pretty good outcomes outcomes, and, and making recommendations for long-term treatment. Um, but what happens when this theory is applied to so many different disorders and it encompasses an impossibly broad list of diagnoses uh, is that we have to start looking at how and why we are making recommendations. What is the evidence base? And in this regard, you know, we have to appreciate the role of expectation in mental health uh, treatment and the role of the placebo. And the pioneering researcher in this regard is uh, Irving Kirsch, a psychologist, and he's put forth two uh, very notorious meta-analyses now at this point uh, where he has demonstrated that the vast majority of the effect of antidepressants is attributable to what's called the active placebo effect. So what that is, is that you have two arms, you have the patients getting placebo and you have the patients getting medication, but these medications have known side effects, right, that actually patients are warned about. And so when they start to have a bit of a headache or some gastrointestinal distress, they know they're getting the treatment. And so something about the role of direct-to-consumer advertising, teach, teaching patients that actually, you know, they're fixing a chemical imbalance, and then they start to feel that actually, you know, probably something is going on and they're being fixed, that expectation plays the majority of the role in positive outcomes. 
but are we really seeing the whole story? And the most uh, impressive paper is a now famous study from 2008 in the New England Journal that uncovered um, data from um, unpublished data. There were 12 antidepressants essentially approved based on 74 studies. And what, what Turner found was that of 38 positive studies with positive outcomes, 37 of them were published, right? That sort of makes sense. But of 37 negative outcomes, only three of them were published. 22 of them weren't, and actually 11 of them were published with a positive spin, which is often referred to as data dredging. So if we're making these recommendations to patients, we're putting you know, one in four women on these medications based on questionable short-term efficacy data. What about long-term safety, right? Because as a psychiatrist, I, I observe that most patients are started on medications that they really remain on for the rest of their lives for the most part. And you know, in this realm, we have uh, Robert Whitaker, who's a pioneering investigative journalist, to thank for analyzing the existing data about um, naturalistic, retrospective, and prospective studies, which essentially all demonstrate, without exception, that long-term treatment with antidepressants, and actually he goes into the other categories of psychotropics as well, benzodiazepines, stimulants, and antipsychotics, that long-term treatment actually confers worse functional um, outcomes so that we're turning what might otherwise have been a one-episode uh, illness with recovery within six to 12 months spontaneously, we're turning this into a chronic and disabling uh, disease. So these are some of the mainstream concerns for, for those who are challenging the paradigm of psychiatry, but with my training, I bring even a couple more concerns uh, to the table. I'm concerned about the role of medications, the sort of unintended consequences. Um, so mitochondrial damage, the effects on, on cortisol receptor status, and also the role of uh, in utero exposure in, in epigenetic expression, so methylation. Um, and this was a, a paper on Prozac. So from this perspective, we really need to, to sort of reinvent how we're thinking about depression and, and mental illness in general. And we need to start to think about it as uh, the way we think about a fever, right? That, that it shows us that there's potential for multifocal etiology. There are many things that can contribute to this symptom. But in the same way, you know, as, as I described to my patients, in the same way that you can have, your toe can hurt for many different reasons, right? You can have a string tied around it, you can have a hammer dropped on it, or you can have an infection in your toenail. And the, t the pain is actually just an indication that there's something out of balance. It doesn't actually tell us more than that. So through this lens, we think about depression and anxiety as having these many contributors, and we'll, we'll you know, sort of tore through some of them now. So we think about concepts like oxidative damage, nutritional deficiency, uh, endocrine disruption, and also the role of the microbiome. And this is really what has given birth to, to sophisticated terms like psychoneuroendocrinology and psychoneuroimmunology to demonstrate really the interconnectedness that, as Nando said, it's, it's not a head-up phenomenon anymore. We're missing the mark. And really, the, the thread that ties all of these concepts together is through my lens, really, that of inflammation. Okay, so this is going to be familiar to just about everyone here, but it's a schematic essentially depicting how uh, inflammatory contributors and exposures have changed, right? So it, with, with um, highlights on the agricultural and industrial revolution. And in this way, depression really joins the ranks of other chronic diseases, heart disease, autoimmunity, diabetes, and cancer. And the model is uh, really, from an evolutionary perspective, is that of depression functioning as what has been dubbed sickness behavior. So with symptoms you know, that were potentially, again, as, as Nanda was describing, potentially adaptive at a certain point in history um, when there was an inflammatory threat or infectious threat. So symptoms of lethargy, sleep disturbance, decreased social activity, mobility, libido, learning, anorexia and anhedonia, this is depression, right? And in many ways, evolutionarily, this was probably an adaptive state for bodily repair. And we're looking at what was formerly adaptive now confronting the triggers of our modern, modern environment, and there's, there's a mismatch that we have to reckon with. So the literature on, um, on the cytokine model, as it's called, of depression is actually about two decades old now. And we have evidence for the predictive value of 
of biomarkers like C-reactive protein, so something you can measure just about any lab uh, in America very easily, we have uh, demonstrated that these biomarkers can be predictive and also linearly correlated so that the more, you know, higher blood levels of cytokines uh, like interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha, uh, the more sick a patient is and that, in fact, when they recover symptomatically, you can monitor those um, cytokines as, as tapering down. And, you know, my specialization is in, in perinatal psychiatry, so I think that the model of postpartum depression as, as an inflammatory condition is actually one of the most helpful to elucidate, uh, you know, sort of the, the potential for, for thinking about an inflammatory model of, of depression punctuated with anxiety. So these are some of the sort of... Um, you know, papers substantiating the role of inflammatory markers as being highly correlated and, again, predictive of incidents of postpartum depression. What's interesting to me is that, you know, again, sort of in, in a long legacy of medical oopses, you know, we didn't re really know that the brain had any immune activity even 10 years ago. And now it's, it's really uh, sort of there's an explosion of literature substantiating the importance of brain-based immunity, not only in, in healthy uh, individuals, but certainly in, in states of... Um, of neurological pathology and psychiatric pathology. So in this model, we understand that inflammatory cytokines, like the ones that I've mentioned, what they, what they can potentially do is traffic this message from the body to the brain, stimulate an enzyme called IDO, and actually skew um, tryptophan catabolism so that there is production of these, you know, excitotoxic uh, sort of you know, otherwise problematic compounds, the most, the best studied one is called quinolinic acid. It's actually an NMDA agonist, so it has highly stimulating effects, and in different parts of the brain, it has different levels of activity. So in postpartum depression, it's very common to have a woman who presents with uh, profound, you know, sort of self-reported depression, but also punctuated often with intense anxiety and agitation and often intrusive images, you know, of, of her, her baby being knocked on the corner of the table or falling out of the window or, or you know, knives. And it's often very... Um, you know, sort of intensely disturbing. And so there's a, an understanding through this model of why the limbic system is differentially stimulated by quinolinic acid relative to the frontal lobe. So she's actually not able to inhibit in, in a normative way, inhibit these sorts of images and, and thoughts. And I find that really satisfying to sort of have an explanation for what I'm seeing with my patients. But how is it that inflammation can get out of control? And I think that's where we need to recruit in the endocrinology. We have to recruit in the role of our stress response system and appreciate that the brain is actually the master organ when it comes to managing our stress response and namely um, the role of cortisol feedback. So we have this concept of allostatic load, sort of how, how full is your bucket before it overflows? And we know that there are many factors that can contribute to when our buckets do overflow and a lot of that is perception. But it's the ability to adapt that actually determines, you know, in our best understanding, when symptoms do emerge and when they don't. So this is a sort of schematic of different patterns of adaptation, some of which may be, um, you know, sort of beneficial in terms of symptom suppression and, and some of which may actually lead to further inflammation. So in the setting of pregnancy, you know, it's again a good model because we have this tremendous stress uh, put on, you know, put on the system in terms of adaptation within 24 hours of delivery. You have all of these tremendous, um, pl you know, plummeting hormones. And in, uh, in pregnancy, the, the placenta actually takes over the role of cortisol production and sort of quiets down the brain-based production. And what happens, we're, you know, we're the only mammals that don't consume our placenta. And so when you eliminate that stimulatory organ, uh, the body is forced to adapt. And obviously, in the majority of cases, about 90% of the time, that actually happens successfully. But this is thought to be one of the determining factors, poor adaptation to uh, cortisol um, regulation that can, that can lead to a suppressed state of... Um, uh, a suppressed cortisolemia, and also this inflammatory incline, right? Because it's cortisol that is our natural anti-inflammatory hormone. 
And this mirrors sort of what we're seeing in the rest of psychiatry. There's sort of probably a false dichotomy, but at least there's two categories that we're looking at, melancholic and atypical depression. And it's atypical depression, which has different features. So um, sort of oversleeping, overeating, um, intense reactivity to the environment, a lot of agitation and anxiety. It's this pattern that has been more correlated symptomatically with the inflammatory model. So it certainly fits that this pattern is also the one that demonstrates consistently low levels of, of cortisol. So again, what's happening postpartum, as far as we understand, is that there's this hypercortisolism of late pregnancy, which leads to a, an adrenal suppression. You throw out the placenta, and the hypothalamus has to come back on board, but sometimes it doesn't. And this is actually being mirrored in some other syndromes like uh, fibromyalgia and, um, and Cushing syndrome, Cushing's disease. So, you know, this is how we have to start to think about things from multiple different etiologic viewpoints. So in this list, you know, there's consideration of many different potential causes of postpartum depression. In any given woman, it could be any of these, right? It could be dietary, could be hormonal, could be particularly thyroid, autoimmunity. And, you know, what we're focusing on now is the role of the hypoth hypothalamic pituitary uh, adrenal axis and inflammatory mechanisms. So we have this sort of complex web, you know, that I've, I've woven up until this point. Um, and we know that inflammation is at least a driver, but it's not the cause necessarily. There's still something that has to trigger the inflammation and drive it. Uh, so where do we enter? You know, where, where does, you know, the clinician actually think of um, starting? And so for this, we actually have uh, a large body of literature supporting the role of uh, lipopolysaccharides. So this um, compound gram-negative bacteria in the gut that when it's exposed to the immune system uh, through intestinal permeability actually has the potential to induce states of clinical depression. And we, this is actually how they cause quote-unquote depression in an animal model, whatever that means. Um, and this schematic is actually, I think, pretty helpful because if you follow the orange lines, you'll see that it's actually with the gut microbiota that we need to begin. That's probably where we should start to focus because it's actually the early seeding, what's called self-completion of uh, the microbiota in early infancy that the stress response is established. So I need things to be sort of simple in my mind. So for me, this is very appealing to think about the fact that actually the gut microbes come first and they dictate the nature of a lifelong uh, stress response system and dysregulated inflammation as a result. And, you know, there's sort of papers to substantiate my opinion, which, which is that it's the gut microbiota that are the most important players. So what am I talking about when, I, when I'm speaking about the microbiome? Um, it's probably one of the hottest buzzwords right now, I think, and, and for good reason, because uh, what we're discovering is that, you know, with completion of the Human Genome Project, we needed to figure out where it was that we were outsourcing all of our bodily functions. And it turns out that, you know, 90% of, of the cells that we walk around with every day are actually microbial in origin, so non-human. And in fact, you know, our 23,000 genes are dwarfed by you know, many estimates, but at least the 3 million genes that are brought to the table by uh, primarily bacteria, but other um, commensals. And you know, th the functions that are performed by this ecosystem are vast. Um, you know, including inhibition of pathogen adherence, enterocyte, you know, sort of gut cell protection, and also management of inflammatory signaling through, through IgA, so through this uh, signaling molecule. And in many ways, this has been, you know, this is what leads us to, to think of, our, of ourselves as a super organism and, and in many ways blurs the boundaries between us and our environment and in particularly the microbial world. And so some of the sort of relevant uh, functions of gut bacteria um, to psychiatry and, and neurology are uh, in production of uh, short-chain fatty acids, so specifically butyrate, which has been demonstrated to have uh, brain-based anti-inflammatory effects, specifically in, in microglia. Also nutrient production uh, and, and uh, metabolism of toxins. But really, this is part of a bigger picture of epigenetic communication and, and really rendering largely secondary sort of, uh, you know, what our genes are dictating because of the role of um, uh, mRNA, of transcription factors, and, and transgenes in, 
in helping to determine our gene expression and helping us to appreciate that environment and lifestyle are in many ways uh, where it's at. So how do we build this microbiome? How has it been done for several million years? And how is it that we've, we've come so far off course? Well, we used to think uh, that the, the uterus was and, and, and sort of the womb was a sterile place, right? And should be no bacteria in there. And of course, we've, we've learned that we were wrong once again. Uh, and that actually, you know, maternal provisioning of bacteria is, is actually universal in the animal kingdom, and we're no exception. That, that maternal gut bacteria is actually passed to the baby in utero. The placenta itself actually harbors uh, a, a specific, a unique microbiome, and this is also news to us, and exciting news, I think, at that. And then beyond the in utero experiences, of course, the, the birth experience. So I think it's um, now largely undisputed that, that the role of vaginal birth is, uh, is, is paramount in establishment of the microbiome or this self-completion notion. And a, in a recent study, actually, I thought was very interesting, looked at the role of birth location, right? So it took women who birthed vaginally in the hospital versus those who birthed uh, at home and found that they had, that those babies had very different um, microbiota and actually had different propensities towards allergy and asthma, food allergy and asthma later in life at around age seven. And they think that one of the mediating factors was colonization with uh, Clostridium difficile, which is considered by all accounts to be a, a pathogen. And that maybe the, the role of the hospital microbiome, so this microbiome that's cultivated, you know, with excessive use of Purell and, and sanitization and sort of, you know, this, this kill the bugs mentality as opposed to cohabitate with the bugs mentality uh, might be responsible for altering the microbiome of even um, vaginally born babies. When, of course, we now have a good understanding that surgically born babies are often colonized with the, uh, uh, with the, skin flora of, of non-maternal uh, organisms. So that is also interesting. And then there's the role of breastfeeding. Um, so there's this, this sort of um, continued tailoring of the individual uh, infant microbiome through these, the myriad factors in this like incredibly sophisticated dynamic food uh, that, transfer, that transfers you know, multiple immune factors and specifically over 200 um, uh, oligosaccharides, which are essentially prebiotics specifically designed for the promotion of beneficial bacterial growth. And interestingly, you know, even the potential epigenetic communication of these immune-related mRNAs. And, you know, it, it just sort of floors me because the last time I checked, you know, Enfamil or your standard formula doesn't have these in the ingredient list. So I think that it's an important thing to sort of appreciate the significance of when we're considering the, the potential benefits of, of breastfeeding. But what's interesting to me is that you can actually, according to at least this one study, you can undo so many of those benefits with the weaning diet. So with weaning your infant to a standard American low-fat diet in this study, the potential protective effects around obesity and inflammation were actually largely undone. Uh, and so that's maybe how we are... Um, messing things up. So that might be one of the many ways that we've, we've influenced and, and evolved our microbiome that now we are handing down transgenerationally. This was, a, I thought, a very important study that came out this past year that looked at comparative fecal analysis of um, one of the, the last hunter-gatherer tribes in, in Africa to uh, comparing them to urban-dwelling Italians and found that there was almost no overlap in their microbiota. And interestingly to me, there were gender disparities you know, between the men and women in this tribe um, that they suspected were related to consumption of tubers, so like root vegetables uh, by the women specifically. And also that what one of our most prized uh, beneficial bacteria, which is bifidobacter. You know, if you buy any probiotic on the market, it's going to have bifidobacter in it, was actually totally absent from the, from the microbiome of these hunter-gatherers. So sort of, you know, we have more questions than we have answers at this point. But we do know that we are manipulating, uh, you know, 
somewhat strategically and somewhat recklessly um, our immune systems through these various exposures. Um, unfortunately, you know, research into most of these uh, agents is, is thoroughly insufficient to justify safety if we're looking through the lens of the relevance of the microbiome. You know, this concept is really totally novel to the, to the allopathic researcher or, or even clinician. And so when, we, when I find a study like this, it's sort of uh, impressive to me that, that anyone's really looking at it. So this is Zyprexa. This is a, the best-selling uh, antipsychotic on the market that's used for myriad indications, not just for schizophrenia. And you know, this particular study found that it's actually altered the microbiota in, in rodents. We don't know how that's happening, but you know, at least that it's demonstrated it is just gives us some indication that we probably should be paying attention to the relevance of uh, this organ you know, when we're looking at safety profiles of, of medications. So how is it that we can actually potentially influence uh, epigenetic gene expression and optimize our, our microbiota? It's always going to be, uh, in, in my sort of um, clinical practice, it's always going to be first through dietary change. So the type of um, dietary approach that I take with my patients is one that primarily looks at controlling for the role of blood sugar instability, which I believe strongly can masquerade as many different psychiatric symptoms from uh, panic to generalized anxiety to even obsessive compulsive uh, disorder, which is the sort of like up and down roller coaster ride that your blood sugar can take if you are uh, eating a carb based uh, diet, particularly refined flours but also looking at the role of um, agricultural foods and, and certainly post-industrial foods in triggering inflammation. So getting back to that initial etiology I, I referenced in the beginning. And so the template that I, um, I find most helpful clinically is uh, one that's very similar to um, to Paul Jaminet's Perfect Health Diet, uh, maybe save for the dairy component, which I often do experiment with with patients based on uh, literature and psychiatry implicating casein in uh, all uh, sort of different categories of mental illness from bipolar to schizophrenia to depression. Uh, but it's actually, you know, sort of a moderate um, uh, carb, high fat profile. So I focus a lot on saturated fats with the women that I treat and actually push them to go out of their way to include things like egg yolks and ghee and coconut oil and animal products. Uh, and I find that it's within, you know, two to three weeks we can shift them into um, a more keto adapted state and then we can start to introduce um, non-grain carbs after about a month. And this method has, you know, afforded me very, you know, robust clinical results. I haven't started a patient on medication in several years now for that reason, I think. Um, and so again, just the focus on fat, sort of orienting patients to what that actually means, because I think a lot of patients, when they think of fat, they think of olive oil, um, and they stop there, right? <laughs> so... I also try to, you know, sort of uh, introduce my patients to an appreciation of, again, this like hyper-sophisticated mechanism of, of many um, sort of uh, culinary herbs and, and spices. I'm very interested in, in the power of turmeric and specifically curcumin. Um, there are about five uh, randomized trials at this point demonstrating its efficacy for treatment. Of course, a single agent, a single pill is never going to be, you know, the, the cure, even if it's a natural one, probably, but uh, it requires a more holistic lens. But I do think this is pretty engaging, and it's probably because human does about, you know, at least these, uh, this many things, if not more, all at once. Um, so I have, in my practice, I focus a lot on, on there it is sort of food tricks, as I call them, sort of using foods therapeutically, so, so gelatin for its glycine content, uh, which is a calming amino acid, um, and coconut oil for its medium chain triglycerides, liver for just about everything it offers. If you're not willing to eat it as an actual food, there's uh, many ways to cheat on that. And, um, and also the role of uh, fermented foods and this concept of using what's now being dubbed psychobiotics. So using uh, beneficial probiotics, and of course I also tend to recommend them in um, 
in nutraceutical products, but using them as treatment. And there's actually a, a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial using a 30-day probiotic regimen for anxiety that demonstrated um, statistically significant efficacy. I mean, I think that's pretty remarkable and, and, and begs us to sort of look at this through, through a remarkably different lens. So this is sort of what I hope early intervention will begin to look like, rather than toddlers on stimulants and teens on antipsychotics. So it's an appreciation of, of food as information, food that influences the microbiome, uh, the inflammatory and stress response feedback loops, and really, in many ways, establishes resilience for, for future mental health. So that's it. Ten minutes early. <laughs> That's probably not a good sign. Hi, and thank you. Um, I had a question about, you mentioned that you can undo a lot of the benefits of breastfeeding by weaning to a standard American diet. Is there any research or is it possible to do the opposite? If you're formula fed, if you wean mm. to a high fat, high nutrient diet, can you fix some of the problems from not breastfeeding? So the, the epigenetic window appears to be most um, relevant in the first three years. So I would, I would assume the answer would be yes. I mean, I also think that, you know, I encourage my, my patients who are formula feeding to use what we got, you know, to use probiotics, to, to introduce as many sort of like, you know, whether it's, it's vitamin D, you know, or other augmentation fats, um, coconut oil, to use these things to supplement. Because this is really, in my opinion, not a formula on the market that's acceptable. Um, and so I, I do think you could sort of augment. And I certainly believe that there is malleability to, to the microbiome. I mean, it's, I treat adults who've been, you know, trashing their bodies for decades and I get outcomes within two months. So it's, it's certainly possible. And I think that's absolutely, it's a, it's a great question. Um, but it's probably also in the chronicity of exposure, right? So, you know, these, these patients, these babies were weaned to a low fat, you know, to, to 1% milk or skim milk and they ate it for, you know, decades. So, you know, in this case, seven years in that study, but probably went on to eat it for decades. So, um, but again, you know, diet is, is obviously only one piece of the puzzle. So stress response, movement, you know, sun exposure, there are many things that come into play here, but of course it's the one I think I use as, as leverage. Great question. Yeah. She said, are there any protective effects for the mother in terms of mood or maybe risk of postpartum depression with uh, breastfeeding? Yes, exactly. So it seems to be sort of a two-way street. There's a couple papers that uh, and I've, I've written about this very subject um, that suggests that actually breastfeeding is protective for the first three months, um, but also that depression itself, if, if it's in the third trimester antenatally, is uh, interfering with breastfeeding initiation. So it's a bit of a two-way street. And, you know, there are many reasons why that could be, right? It could be sort of like self-satisfaction, sort of bonding, um, or maybe it is hormonal, and certainly oxytocin is something, is a hormone that, that I use clinically in practice and one that's been implicated in, in sort of one of the potential ideologies of postpartum. Um, so the Weston A. Price has written a lot about the quality of breast mi milk impacted by the mother's diet, which makes a lot of sense, of course. They also talked about um, mothers that have a diet low in animal products are better off uh, feeding their children homemade formula. What are your thoughts about the breast milk quality and that whole kind of controversy? Hmm. That's a great question. I would probably disagree with that, mostly because of the, you know, the slides that I showed on those, you know, on exosomes and, and microRNAs. I mean, there's just so much going on in breast milk. We we don't have the we're looking through a keyhole, you know. We and to, so to think, I, I certainly would recommend a homemade formula over a store bought. But to think that we've captured all of the essential information, it's not only about fats, right? It's it is about fats, but it's also about immune factors, maybe more importantly. So I would probably disagree. Although I'm a big Weston Price yeah, fan. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so my question is about breast milk banks. Do yes. you recommend breast milk banks to your clients or 
what are the things that you're doing to promote uh, breast milk banking yes. for its growth? Yes, I do support it. There's um, very few, I'm in New York, and there's very few options. There's a prominent one in New Jersey. Um, I think that, you know, it's, it's again a trade-off, right, because there are probably elements, immune factors that are passed on that we can't assess for, you know, screening for HIV. I mean, that's just a, sort of the, a drop in the bucket in terms of identifying the integrity of the breast milk. So certainly I do think there are probably unknown risks, um, but I, I, I just have so many concerns about the insufficiencies of, of formula that I think it's certainly a better option, probably even a better option for the same reason than, than homemade formula. Yeah. A uh, couple quick questions. What's the source of the bacteria in the placenta, and do you know what type, please? So that's a great question. So um, most of the uh, bacteria, whether it's in the placenta or enteromammary, so it's a breastfeeding past uh, bacteria, or in the um, uterus, is of gut origin, uh, so maternal gut, so cecal specifically, um, bacteria. And of course, it can be, you know, of, of dependent varieties depending on, um, on the mom's health. So no, how is it seeded then? We don't really know. There are a couple of theories about like dendritic cells taking up bacteria from the mom's gut and, and shuttling them around, you know, systemically. Um, but they're, they're mostly theories at this point. I don't think anybody's like tagged bacteria and, and monitored its, its uh, motility. But yeah, so it's an, it's an immune transfer. Yes, yes. And that's really what's um, debunked the myth of the sterile womb. We thought, you know, that, that there wasn't much, that actually any pathogen in there was um, going to be cause of preterm labor or something like that. And, and in fact, you know, it's, it's not only that immune tolerance is a factor. So, you know, you and I could both be colonized by a parasite. For me, I could have no inflammatory response and it can be a commensal. And for you, it can be, you know, the cause of a tremendous amount of inflammation. So that's why this is going to be a tough thing. You know, one of the things I, I highlighted in the slide is, you know, is it too late to establish what a healthy microbiome actually looks like? You know, all of us are sort of far down this road, right, of, of deleterious sort of effects. So, I think that's uh, one of the biggest questions is sort of how, how can we establish what a healthy human is anymore? <laughs> yeah. Hi, you um, represented breast milk as the best guess that you use for the- um, Template. For the, for the template for macronutrient ratios for adults. Um, what's your comment on, I've, I've read some research which suggests that maybe fallacious for adults in as much as the relatively high sugar content of breast milk, bearing in mind that the infant is in mild ketosis, is really there yes. to, to help the infant rapidly put on fat so it can survive the, the winter, so to speak. And since adults don't really want to be rapidly putting on fat, maybe it, 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 the template would need to be tweaked for post-weaned individuals. What's yes. your comment? Yes. Um, really, I arrived at that template clinically. I think it's an interesting idea. I think it's just an idea um, at this point. You know, the Perfect Health Diet goes through a, a lot of the science supporting their claims, and, and I think it's a, a wonderful uh, starting point. But what I found with adult women who were glucose metabolism adapted for the better part of 30 years uh, was that when I would move them into a ketogenic diet, uh, they might feel better better after the first 10 days for, you know, about two to three weeks. And then they would start to have symptoms of essentially subclinical hypothyroidism. So they would start to get dry skin, hair loss, cloudiness. This actually was my personal experience as well on a ketogenic diet. And so I do think that there's gender disparities. That's why I found the HASDA um, research really compelling because it echoed what I observed, which is that many women feel better on a, a, a moderate carb, sort of root vegetable, sort of uh, carb sourced model. Now, the, the therapeutic effects of a ketogenic diet are pretty well established. I think at this point in psychiatry is a growing literature, but there is suggestion that in, in bipolar mania and schizophrenia that there may be a therapeutic role for a ketogenic diet. So I do think that, you know, it's, there's not one for everyone, but I also think that's the beauty of using coconut oil therapeutically. It's like even in a glucose-adapted person, you can provide immediate source of ketones even if they aren't producing them themselves. So some cheese. One more question. Okay. I had a couple, but um, 
for, I'll uh, ask both of them. So the one is placenta. So if somebody's encapsulating their placenta, yes. is that going to have the same clinical effect as eating your placenta right after birth? Yes. And then second with the bacteria. So there's this big push to, if you're GBS positive, right at week oh, yeah. 36, you should take antibiotics yes. once you go into labor. And what's that effect? Yes, that's having. That's that's a very powerful question. I've actually written recently about that. If you want more information on, you, it's on my website. But um, because I do think I'll just answer that answer that one first. I do think that's uh, one of the most powerful influences of the this sort of uh, devolution of our microbiota as women is actually the administration of antibiotics intra. Um, uh, intrapartum, and you know the the according to the Cochrane database, which is you know the gold standard of evaluation of available medical research, um, it's it's not an effective intervention in terms of preventing infant mortality. So what are we doing? You know, and and the effects and the consequences are so profound that. You know, if, if, if there's not established benefit, we need to re-examine that. But I actually find, you know, if you scratch the sur surface, no offense to any OBs in the audience, but if you scratch the surface of obstetrical practice, you'll find that, you know, less than, according, you know, to the available data, less than 30% of conventional obstetrical care is actually rooted in the literature. You know, it's just like the Wild West, what they're doing. It's just, and, it's, and it's, you know, as I've argued, there's never a more important time to, to protect you know, epigenetic expression and, and, and microbiota inflammatory responses. It's, it's during those nine months and, and delivery. So I have grave concerns about that, and I encourage women to opt out. You're allowed. It's your body. Um, and then in terms of encapsulation, I get that question a lot. I, I think that there is, uh, you know, I encourage women to, to actually, like, if they're going to consume their placenta, to do it immediately, raw, right away, pretty much. Because I've actually had a couple patients with um, negative clinical outcomes consuming it over weeks. And I, I've thought about, again, right, because I talked about the placenta producing cortisol, like I've thought about the mismatch there in terms of like the temporal uh, rehabilitation of, of that rhythm I was talking about. So I think it's probably not dangerous for the most part. It's certainly not an evidence-based practice in terms of d depression treatment or prevention. Um, but I think if you are going to do it, it's probably best to find somebody help you do it the way it might be done, you know, by other mammals. Okay, we're going to have to call it. Thank you so cool. much. Cool.